Welcome to The Writing Monkey, a podcast for writers about everything but writing. Subject matter experts and unique individuals are interviewed for writers by a writer. Hey, Ralph. Thank you so much for taking my call today. Just kind of introduce yourself, who you are, what you've done. My name is Ralph Pizzullo. Uh, I'm a writer, playwright, written some New York Times bestsellers. Uh, I grew up the son of a diplomat and uh, countries like Bolivia, Colombia, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Vietnam. And I think I've written now uh, around 22 books, a lot of them having to do with uh, the intelligence community, CIA, FBI, and a uh, number of books about the military, uh, including SEAL Team 6. I was so thrilled to have you on as a guest because just I was overwhelmed by your uh, experience and the books you've written. So I decided to oh, focus. Yeah, I decided to focus this one on the CIA. I'll, I might has, I'll have you back if that's possible and talk about sure. other things because there's just, sure. just such a wealth of uh, information that you have. It's so inspirational. And the the whole goal of my podcast, my mission really is to be informative to writers, to help inform them, to help their creativity, to get past writer's block, but also to give people a chance to straighten out misconceptions about what they do or what their expertise is or what their life may be. So with you, I was just wanting to get right into asking questions about the CIA, what it is, just sure. overall for people who don't know, just what the CIA stands for, what the agency does. It's the Central Intelligence Agency. It's headquartered in Langley, Virginia, which is in right outside of Washington, D.C., on the other side of the Potomac River. It consists of about 20 to 25,000 people. Most of them are analysts. And the, the role of the CIA is basically to collect human intelligence overseas about threats to the United States. So they have, uh, you know, it's divided between analysts and uh, operatives or what they call case officers. And the case officers are deployed overseas. Their job is to collect human, it's called, it's, it's human intelligence. So they develop, uh, they develop sources, you know, in other governments and, uh, in, in t you know, terrorist organizations and financial organizations that they're, they're constantly looking for information uh, about people who are uh, planning attacks on the United States or our, or our allies. So that's, that's their main role. So their main job really is to collect as much information globally yeah. as possible that and, and uh, don't they do a daily briefing for the president? Well, yeah, they, one, of the, one of the things that they do is they, they prepare a briefing for the president every day on sort of, you know, critical, critically important information has surfaced that day. So it might be about uh, rumors about a terrorist attack or the, the, the killing of an important enemy uh, in conflict in, you know, Syria or Iraq. Intelligence about, for example, now Iranian violations of the... Uh, arms sales to North Korea, you know, anything like that. So we have a lot of agencies in this country. I imagine there's a lot of overlap or cooperation. Is that true? Yeah, there is a lot of overlap. The FBI does sort of the equivalent of the CIA in the United States, uh, except that the CIA doesn't have any sort of law enforcement capability like the FBI does. But the FBI also does, you know, a lot of surveillance, collecting information on possible criminal groups in the United States, criminal activity. Right. And then there's the NSA, which is National Security Security Agency, which is which is headquartered in Meade, Maryland, which is also near Washington D.C. And their job is sig in, so it's signal information intelligence. Right. In other words, so they they track cell phone calls. Phone calls, radio transmissions uh, between you know suspected enemies of the United States, uh, right. discussing um, anything from you know security breaches to you know planning attacks, things like that. So they they um, so they have phone calls. Yeah, they have a massive. I'm sure nobody really knows this unless you work for the, the NSA, but they do have massive computers, banks of computers somewhere, right? That just 
filter yeah. all this information. They have to store it and look yeah. for keywords, patterns, things like that. Yeah, yeah, they store, you know, they record all kinds of things. What I, from what I understand, the problem for, with them is, is always the translation. Right. So there's such a high volume volume of material that they collect, and most of it is, you know, in foreign languages. And uh, so there's, there's always uh, one of the problems, even, um, you know, kind of leading up to 9-11 and uh, things that were discussed in the, uh, the 9-11 report was the inability of the translators to keep up with all the, inf all the phone calls and all the transmissions that were captured by the NSA. I think at that point they were like three months behind. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they weren't further. I'm reading Left of Boom, which is a book I'm really enjoying. And uh, I tried to get through the whole thing, but I'm kind of uh, enjoying it too much to speed through it. <laughs> and um, I would encourage my listeners to read it too. It's really interesting and it's a really unique look at a CIA operative, a case officer. Is yeah, that right? He was a case yeah. officer. Yeah, he's a case, Doug was a case officer. That's correct. And you met him face to face, right? Yeah, yeah. He he contacted me contacted me about hmm, maybe four and a half years ago. I I wrote another book uh, in two thousand and five with another CIA case officer called Jawbreaker. Right. And it's apparently you know very well known within the CIA and considered you know, the the most accurate depiction of you know the life of a case officer. Oh, that's and next Doug, on my reading list then. Doug approached me. He said, you know, I just I just left the CIA uh, and I want to write a book about my experience. Uh, we met in a hotel lobby here in Los Angeles. You know, first thing that struck me was how young he was. Um, he was around 30 years old at the time. He said he told me he'd been in the CIA for seven years and he, he uh, you know, described, you know, just briefly, you know, some of his experiences and his story. And I said, yeah, I'd you know, love to work with you. Whenever I work with people like Doug or, you know, other people that I've collaborated with who have, who have worked in the government, I always kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're new to publishing, so I sort of, like, outline to them how long it takes because books take, as you know, I'm sure, take a long time. We have to basically come up with a proposal and, you know, then I give that to my agent and, uh, you know, he'll get back to us with notes or, or su suggested changes, and then it's submitted to publishers. And, you know, I have relationships with certain publishers, and, you know, we kind of go to them first. So I just sort of take took Doug through the whole process. And then we just started, uh, you know, communicating back and forth. You know, we'd talk on the phone, and he would, I would ask him questions and ask him to record different episodes from, from the time he was in Afghanistan. And, and Syria and you know he sent them to me and you, you know start to put the book together and you know there's a lot of communication back and forth yeah, that's incredible while that, while that goes on you have done yeah books take time and yeah. um, well, that's a, something that a lot of people don't understand they think it's gonna you know come out you know, it's gonna be written and it's gonna come out like you know a month or two later I tell them uh, you know hey sometimes it takes a year you know after the book's finished so it's not just you know, writing the book, it's also, but the editorial process is really long. I mean, I've done books that came out, you know, the publishers rushed to put out and happened very quickly, and then others, which it takes, uh, it's a year after it's, the manuscript is finished and accepted by the publisher, it takes another year before it comes out. So yeah. it, it really depends on, you know, the publisher's uh, calendar and uh, what other books they have on their list for, for that year and, you know, how they want to space them out. You know, so a, a lot of it is out of the author's hands. Right. And I, I explain that, I have to explain that to my collaborators. Yeah, I had one author, I mean, one publisher. They were a big professional outfit. I, I uh, wrote a nonfiction book for them about computer art, and I was amazed how fast they moved. They wanted this thing out within three months. They had wow. over 30 people working on it, reading it, just yeah. combing over it, and it was amazing how fast they, yeah. they can work when they need to. Yeah, that's, I did a book called Inside Field Team 6, and they wanted that book out quickly because I wrote it shortly after the Bin Laden raid. Yeah. And they, you know, there's a lot of interest in SEAL Team 6 and the publisher, which was Little Brown, you know, they wanted the book as fast as possible. And uh, so I just, you know, dropped everything else and worked on that and it came out. I mean, actually what happened, uh, 
out. We finished it very quickly, and they were going to put it out like a month and a half later. And then we ran into some trouble with, uh, you know, getting it vetted through the CIA. Yeah, I can imagine that would add another yeah. layer of delay. That added like three or four months to the process. Oh, just to let you and the listeners know, I am going to have uh, show notes that will have links to the books you mentioned and things like that. So we already discussed the typical CIA employee. They come from a college education. They they need to. They need to be intelligent people. Yes. They. Yes. They sift through events, news, information, then compile it. And they must also have some level of ability to assess what's important or not and pass it up a food chain. Sure. And this happens on a daily basis. Yeah. So where would the typical CIA employee come from? Yeah, they're recruited from from, uh, universities all over the country. You know, there are two kinds of CIA officers, two basic kinds. One are the the, the case officers, as I said before. And those are the people who are out in the field collecting information and developing sources and assets. And then most of the people in the CIA are analysts, and so they receive all the information, they receive all the uh, you know the reports from the field, and they assess assess them in in the context of you know whatever is going on in that particular country at the time, try to uh, uh, evaluate what the threat level is, whether a particular source is credible or not. They kind of cross-check if they get information from somebody, they'll, they'll, they'll try to, you know, compare it or cross-check it to information they get from somebody else uh, to look for to corroborate it. So there, there are two different kinds of people. So they're more the, the bookish nerds. Yeah, that's right. The analysts are more of, of, of uh, you know, the academic type. Right. And so, you know, you, you probably would find a lot of, you know, political science majors, history majors, right. uh, that kind of person. The, the case officers are more the ones that I've met are pretty sort of more type A types of people, you know, kind of aggressive. And they're also, they look, they look for people who are, you know, ability to adapt to different cultures, operate under stress, um, and also uh, are good with people. They have to be, you know, because basically you're trying to get people to rat out their friends. Right. You know, yeah, flip them. Or turn the government. Them. And so, you know, it takes, a, you know, there's certain you know, skills that they look for in terms of uh, interpersonal skills. Yeah, I noticed in the book, Doug mentioned that it seemed like there were a lot of white bread Mormons because of their, um, they haven't done drugs, they spoke multiple yeah. languages, but they also weren't, didn't blend in well with other cultures, obviously, Middle East, things like that. That's right. Yeah, there's, there's uh, Doug complains about that a lot. Um, and is that ac- the- accurate in your uh, experience? Yeah, well, Part of the, you know, one of the things that, the, you know, the seat that they've got a very strict drug policy. So if you've ever used, you know, smoked uh, marijuana or used any kind of hallucinogenic drug, you, you know, you're disqualified. Given what's gone on in our society in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you know, that really eliminates a lot of people. Yeah, I imagine that's going to change. Yeah, you know, and, 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 you know. A lot of a lot of case officers complain about it, saying like, you know, this is kind of outdated and stupid, really, because we're we're not getting the best people. Part of the reason they like Mormons, also, uh, that Mormons are attracted attracted to the CIA, apart from the fact that they're very, you know, they don't do drugs, they don't drink, you know, that kind of thing. Very straight laced. The other part of it is is that uh, all Mormons do a mission, overseas mission, right. And so a lot of them have had experiences living overseas and know another language, and uh, and that comes in useful. But uh, as Doug points out in Left of Boom, you know, you're dealing with sort of um, certain kinds of people. They're not like the highest uh, people of the highest integrity uh, when you're developing assets and sources. And so if you're too priggish or you're too... Right. You have too many moral judgments. It's, it's not going to work. You have to be somebody who's you know pretty open minded, uh, has dealt with people at all levels of society, and is comfortable dealing with people at all levels of society. And uh, you know, Doug feels that a lot of uh, you know Mormons are you know aren't, aren't that suitable for. They lack a little um, bit of uh, street smarts, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, do you know if the agency has? 
<laughs> begun to more actively recruit um, Muslim Americans or people oh, yeah. of different... Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of Muslim Americans, yes. I think uh, Muslim Americans have been sort of the unsung heroes of the war on terrorism. Uh, you know, I've met quite a few of them, and yeah, they're, 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 they've done some remarkable stuff. Yeah, I, I recently interviewed a homicide detective, and uh-huh. he was a pretty old, you know, older retired fellow. And I asked him, you know, when they portray in the media, they portray a lot of cops as racist or old, good old boys. And he said, yeah, there's yeah. there's some of those guys, but most of us were very excited when they started letting more women come in and and yeah. blacks and yeah. and Hispanics and all, all walks of life. Because how are yeah. you gonna you cannot infiltrate the clan unless you're a white guy, and you can also not go into a crack neighborhood as a white guy, and yeah. you can't be pretend you're a prostitute to bust a john if you're a guy so they were thrilled to them it's like how are we going to deal with you know most people are good every every segment of society has bad people how are you going to deal with those bad people if you don't have representatives from every segment of society a lot of perceptions of the police i think are very unfair i mean yes there are awful incidents um but i i know a lot of people in law enforcement and you know the pressures that they're under uh all all the time are are uh, you know people don't understand yeah i'm a, i'm eternally grateful for the jobs those guys do cuz i couldn't do it yeah i oh, couldn't do okay. it physically and i couldn't do it emotionally or mentally yeah yeah it's tr- it's tremendously hard and the other thing that people don't uh, realize is you know they're not paid that well either right you know and they're out there risking their lives every day um and they never know who's going to point a gun in their face and uh so it's uh it's a tough job, and yes, there are, you know, some bad apples, as there are in any organization, but uh, I think some of it has been overblown. Not overblown, but, you know, the, the, it's created a perception that there's, you know, rampant racism in every police department or every, you know, most police officers are racists or killers, and, you know, that's really unfair. It's a whole other yeah. interview I'm actually doing, a whole yeah. other conversation. Yeah. But it, it is something interesting to me because part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is primarily to help writers give them food for thought to help, you know, because there's so much you need to learn just to write. But when you start writing fiction and you instantly will hit roadblocks, because if you start writing about a CIA officer or yeah. a surgeon or a, an overweight person or a blind person, any any anything, you immediately realize Either you're smart and realize you don't know anything and you have to go learn it, or you start writing stuff that's a cliche. And yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that, and it's. it's I would urge writers. I mean, I am fortunate to a certain extent because I write fiction and nonfiction. Right. And so in my fiction, I, you know, I, I try to base it as much on, you know, real people and real situations. And because of the, the nonfiction that I write, I've been exposed to a lot of people in the military and, you know, SEALs and right. uh, private military contractors and so on. And, uh, you know, and I, I get information from them and they've been very generous with me. But I would urge anybody who's writing fiction uh, about, you know, police fiction or, you know, anything like, you know, involving the police or the FBI to, uh, you know, to spend some time with, with people like who are in these fields, because if you do, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to find yourself depicting much more nuanced uh, human situations than, you know, just kind of the stock characters that you often right. see on in yeah. movies and television. But they're human beings and they've got kids and they've got, you know, other problems and they're worried about their health and their pension and, uh, you know, their bad knees. And it's not so simple as, I mean, one of, one of the things that, you know, bothers me is we have a tendency in the media, especially, I guess, in TV and movies, to depict people in the military and in, uh, you know, the CIA and and even the police force is just sort of these very, you know, kind of cold-blooded, almost inhuman people, you know, like the cold-blooded assassin. Right. And, you know, they don't, they don't want people like that. You know, the CIA doesn't want people like that. The military doesn't want people like that. Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I know a lot of people in SEAL Team Six, and they they don't want people like that. You know, they want people who are who are human beings, who have feelings, who have empathy for people, and uh, I I think that's missed in a lot of the uh, 
you know, a lot of the depictions. Yeah, they don't want mental illness and weakness. They want strength. And uh, they want strength, and they want and mental strength especially. Yeah. You know, they don't. The, one of the big things in, in the special ops uh, seals or Delta team is, you know, you appropriate force. You know, you don't want to escalate situations. You don't want to, you know, raid a house and end up, you know machine gunning everybody in the house just because one person has a pistol concealed behind them or something like that. They call it like situational awareness. You, you want to be really sharp, very focused on the moment, and at the same time, not losing control. You want to be in control all the time. Yeah. You, you don't want to be overwhelmed by fear. And I think, you know, in a lot of going back to a lot of the, you know, bad incidents that, that we've seen on videotape of, of police shooting people, that probably uh, often has, has, uh, is a factor in those incidents is that, you know, the, the police officer, whoever it is, is over, you know, see, some, see, see somebody, you know, move something and they think it's a gun. And, you know, before they get a, a, a good look at it, you know, they panic a little bit and they start shooting. And that's what you don't want. Right. And unfortunately, I know I was I was raised to respect the police. And in my youth, I drove a ratty car, I had long hair and a beard. And I was stopped almost every other day going to college. Yeah. But I never got a ticket and I never had a problem because I immediately I was respectful and just spoke to yeah. the officer. And yeah. um, unfortunately, it almost seems like people nowadays want to provoke the police and want to confront them. And then the media will only show you two percent of the entire yeah. situation. And then the media will inflame everybody. It's it's almost like they're trying to create a racial divide. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, no, it's very, it's very dangerous, very irresponsible to do that. You know, usually people have, as you mentioned before, you know, they have, they go into it with good motives. And, you know, a lot of times something goes bad, somebody panics uh, on either side, you know, because when you're confronted by the police, you know, you're afraid too. Right. And sometimes people do stupid things and uh, the, the police react badly. Uh, and the same happens in combat. So in all of these fields, CIA, police, uh, military, especially in the special operations community, you know, they, they want people who are in, who, who are in control, who don't panic, and they train them that way. You know, right. They train them to be that way. Like, you know, CIA case officers are highly trained people because they have to go into, like Doug did, you know, they have to, they have to be sitting down with, uh, you know, members of the Taliban who will openly talk about, you know, look, I, I want to kill you. But right now you're paying me money for information, so I'll take the money. But if I get an opportunity to kill you, I will kill you. But Doug made it sound a little almost lackadaisical, like they trained him and sent him over there without telling him anything, and then he just had to kind of figure it out on his own. I mean, is that typical? Well, I think I think they have a big training facility called the Farm, which is in Virginia, and, and you're you know you're put through different scenarios, but it, you know it's not the same as you know, meeting the actual people in the field. I guess, you know, when Doug, you know, in Left of Boom, uh, Doug is assigned to Afghanistan and he's sent to this secret base on the Pakistani border. And that's his first assignment. And so, you know, he's kind of learning on the fly. But see, you know, that's kind of a, somewhat of an unusual situation that, that he was in. Uh, I wanted to circle back around to the podcast itself, which is I'm not advocating that we only write reality because, you know, you and I are both fiction writers and we've both written nonfiction. We know pure nonfiction can be boring. So it's fun to have the rogue cop who doesn't follow the rules. But my goal is to maybe correct some really negative um, assumptions. It's not just about the police. I interview little people, overweight people, all kind of things. And it's partly to give them a chance because people who want to be represented in all media are often yeah. not represented because because authors find it difficult to interview somebody who's different than them. Yeah. You know, they tend to ignore them or write cliched material about them and not include them. So yeah. I guess I say this in every episode, people always are grateful when I stop and talk to them, even if it's awkward at first, like, why are you asking me about my height or my weight or my skin color yeah. or my profession or my sexual preference, whatever it is. Yeah. And 
but they're always grateful when I'm done because they realize, oh, you you want me to, you're giving me the chance to correct misconceptions or inaccuracies about my situation or profession, and you give me the, and then you you're trying to give me the opportunity to be represented in fiction. So I'm not advocating purity. I'm just saying it'd be more fun if the rogue cop actually had a real motivation as a character to do what he's doing, like his yeah. his wife has been abducted, something like that. It's not just um, I'm an asshole and they let me into the police force so I can run around kicking down doors and shooting people. Yeah, no. And I- found that if you approach people with an open mind um, and, and with, without prejudice, they're usually willing to talk to you. They're happy to tell you their story and give you their perspective if you're respectful and you're, like I said, open-minded. And that's a kind of a key to what I do and why people in the CIA and the FBI are willing to collaborate, want to collaborate with me because I come at it with no agenda. No political agenda, no personal agenda. I want to hear their story and I want to tell it the best way that I can. And it's, you know, it's worked you know, pretty well. I find on a personal level, too, if we don't talk to people, especially people who have differences, that's where we have that gap and we have the fear that fills the gap. And then fear causes us to do some stupid things. And uh, I know talking to people who have expressed hatred or diametric views to what I what I may think personally. When you sit and talk to somebody, you find out most people are driven to their extreme by fear. They're afraid of this yeah. or that or the other thing happening or not happening. And when you really talk to someone, you find out, you know, we're pretty close on a lot of things. We're pretty much alike. We want the yeah. same things. We're pretty close yeah, on yeah. things. Well, I think that's something that is hard for, you know, I, I was lucky that I grew up overseas, so I was, I was exposed to lots of different cultures. But I think that that's something that uh, it's hard for most Americans to understand. You know, the people in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, most of them are just the same, you know, pretty much have the same goals as people and the same fears and the same hopes as, as people here in the United States. You know, most of them, whether they're members of the Taliban or they're Muslim or whatever their religion, you know, they, they want a better life for themselves and their family. And that's, yeah. that's, that's true everywhere around, everywhere around the world. You know, they might look different, they might dress different, they're going to have a different history and a different culture, which are very important to understand if you want to have a good appreciation of who they are. But basically, you know, most people want just, you know, they want to live in peace and they want to have a good life. There are only a small, small group of people who are the problem. And, and they cause a lot of trouble. And they, they can cause a lot of trouble. And they do, you know, especially today with, you know, communications the way they are and weapons the way they are. And they're able, like groups like ISIS are able to take, you know, take advantage of situations where there's a lot of chaos, you know, and play it. I've noticed a trend on Facebook, which I was off of for a while because it was just upsetting to be on it. Yeah. But, you know, working with the podcast and guests and audience members and whatnot, I need to be on it a lot. And I've noticed a trend in the last just I think the last few weeks that when something that is potentially upsetting is posted, people immediately look into it now and they start commenting really yeah. quickly. This is fake news. This isn't real. This isn't the whole okay. story. Good. From both sides of the uh, of the belief spectrum, which is a really good thing, we need to police ourselves like that. We can't let you can't just Absolutely. share articles that upset you like they're real. You need to stop and think about That's it. Right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I tell people that all the time is that, you know, and don't believe everything that you even read, you know, in, in you know, the major news sources. Um, oh. It's always important to put things in context and to compare it, you know, to other and, and use your common sense as well. Yeah. Because certain things, you, you know, people will tell me, oh, I, Ralph, I read this article. I said, you know, it just doesn't, I'll look into it, but it just doesn't sound right to me. Right. You know, and if it doesn't sound right, chances are it, it's not it's not right. And you know the the media it has has gotten uh, you know I think a little bit off track. There's a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of you know kind of spreading rumors. Or uh, you know I think the the journalistic standards have lowered 
considerably. Yeah, I started out in journalism with my wife 30 years ago, and we've seen the news cycle compress from a week to, you know, the cable news came out and it was down to yeah. a day or so. Now it's almost instant. The news cycle is, yeah. is like people tearing their hair out. There's no, there's yeah, no yeah. Um, investigation. There's too yeah. many mistakes being made. Yeah, yeah. And the other part of it is are the experts. You know, every one of the channels, you know, CNN and MSNBC and so on, they've got their little panel of experts. You know, I see some of these people and I know some of them. And the, the whole expert thing is, it's you know, it's very broad. They'll have some former military guy or former intelligence officer talking about ISIS. But they're, they're not people who have had any exposure to ISIS or, or have dealt with ISIS or have been on the field you know, in Iraq or Syria. Yeah. They might have served in the CIA or the military 20 years ago. Right. When it, at, you know, in a, in a different part of the world. So you just have to be very careful. I, I always try to check with people on the ground, you know, or people who have been on the ground. And they always have a very different perspective. And they also are very frustrated that Washington, you know, doesn't listen to them. What happens is, you know, a, a political narrative forms in, in Washington, and when people in the field are saying, hey, you know, that's not really the problem here. The problem is, is something else. And that, you know, I think in uh, a Doug story illustrates that uh, a lot. Yeah. And what he was seeing on the ground is not, didn't really sync with what Washington wanted to hear. This is a bit off topic, but it's uh, triggered the thought that I consider myself fairly well read. But what I immediately noticed was how little I knew about the Middle East. Yeah. How it, 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 it's hard to even remember where it is and what countries are on the map. Yeah. There's so many differences. And then the fact that the blinds on the map almost have nothing to do with the tribes and the actual That's culture right. that, that exists right. there. So it's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. No, and we get ourselves into, you know, one situation after another, we're bogged, in, bogged down politically and militarily. Uh, you take Afghanistan, for example. Most people don't know, and most policymakers still don't know, that Afghanistan is, is basically a, a country divided divided by tribes. Right. And tribal loyalties are much more important than national loyalty. We, we went into Afghanistan after 9-11 because we were trying to get bin Laden, and, uh, and the people who were protecting bin Laden were the Taliban. And so the Taliban became the enemy. Well, the Taliban represents the most populous tribe in Afghanistan, the Pashtuns. Sort of by accident, by happenstance, we made ourselves, we, we made our enemy the Taliban, which is the most populous tribe in Afghanistan. And we're still fighting the Taliban. And it's a, a, a war that we'll never, we can never win. And we've aligned ourselves with the minority tribes in Afghanistan. You know, it becomes a very, and you know, we've done we we've done a simple, we did a similar thing in Iraq. And you know, unless you understand these countries and, and understand the, the culture and the history and how they're divided, you know, religiously and, and in terms of religion and in terms of tribes, you know, you can't, you know, you can't just equate it to the United States. It's, they're very, very different. We tend to do that. We tend to say, well, these are the enemies. These are our friends. And as soon as you do that, you're, you know, you, you start taking sides in a conflict that is an internal conflict that's been going on for, you know, sometimes 200 and 300 years or more. Yeah, and it's a conflict I don't think any of us are really can really understand. Yeah, I mean, Saddam Hussein was, was, a, was you know, a, he, he was a, a dictator who was, at, you know, kind of out of control, and, and everybody understands that. But Saddam Hussein, he was a secular leader in a country that was that's very divided between Shiite Muslims and Sunni Muslims. The party that, that supported Saddam Hussein happened to, be, happened to be Sunni. That was the Baptist Party. And they had ruled Iraq for a long time. Well, when we came in and we deposed Saddam Hussein, one of the things that we, we did is we outlawed the Sunni party. 
So immediately, all the Sunnis and, and, and Iraq felt disenfranchised politically. They felt as though the United States was taking sides with the Shiites, which is also the majority party, majority uh, uh, religious group in Iraq, which from a strategic point, point of view is really strange because the Shiites, the people who had been supporting the Shiites in Iraq, were Iran which is our biggest strategic rival in the region. So by overthrowing a dictator for political reasons in the United States, we ended up getting taking sides in a country and getting getting involved in a whole civil war that, you know, I don't think we really intended to do, but that's, that's what happened. So do you think any of these tribes are any better or worse than the others? We just happen to side no, with no, certain think, ones? No, you, they're, no. Not, you know, they have different systems of belief that are sometimes seem very minuscule to us. Like, you know, I, I mean, the Shiites and the Sunnis, it's, it, it, a lot of it just has to do with the lineage from Muhammad and, um, and certain, you know, who's allowed to interpret Islam, uh, you know, uh, different minor interpretations. They all worship the same book, which is the Quran, which they consider to be the the the, the literal word of God. So the, the differences are minor, you know, on the surface, but they're, you know, in these countries culturally and politically deep. And uh, And they're willing so they're willing know, to kill and be killed over these differences? What's that? They're willing to kill and be killed over these yeah. differences? Oh yeah. And then, you know, so. yeah, and that's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, so you can't understand the Middle East, you can't understand a place like Iraq or Syria if you don't understand the divisions between, you know, the Shi- Shiites and, and the Sunnis, and, and, and also, uh, you know, the, the ISIS is, 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 comes out of that as well, because the ISIS was basically a, a movement in the Sunni triangle that came out of the Sunni triangle of, of, of Iraq, you know, of people who felt, uh, who a lot of them were former uh, members of the Republican Guard under Saddam Hussein. They were people who were thrown out of the military and had a Sunni background and felt as though, you know, they were being, you know, their, their groups, their, their, their neighborhoods were being overrun by Shiite militias, and they had to band together militarily, like a gang, almost a criminal gang, to protect themselves. And that grew into this whole, you know, movement with the whole idea of establishing a caliphate, and you know, it it it, right. you know, it grew from there. Um, and then they were able to take advantage of the chaos in Syria. It's, you know, I tell people, uh, I use the example a lot of times. It's like if you have two neighbors who you hear fighting every night and, you know, windows break, glass breaking and people screaming and so on and so forth. And then one night you decide to walk over there, knock on the door and confront the husband and wife and say, hey, what the hell's going on here? Why are you two people fighting? Why don't you just cut it out? And, you know, what's the problem? As soon as you walk in that door, knock on that door, you're going to get yourself involved in something you can't even begin to understand. So do you mind if I circle back around to the CIA? Because we got off on the Middle East, but that was really interesting. And I I wanted to talk about that mainly because I wanted the readers, I mean, the listeners to maybe understand that there's a lot of uh, information there to to sift through. But, you know, going back to the uh, CIA agent, Jason Bourne is, uh, you know, that's a that's a novel came out in the 1980s. And it's a really it's a lot of fun watching the movies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was wondering how accurate that is, if they're yeah. anything close to like that yeah, in not real life. Not accurate at all. <laughs> I mean, okay. it's fun, but <laughs> you know, CIA agents, CIA case officers, they're not they're not they don't call themselves agents. They're case officers. They don't right. they don't kill people. They don't carry right. guns usually. They're not. You know, that they're not assassinating people. They're not that. You know, they don't do that. 
That's not their job. They're field officers. They're still there to collect uh, intel. They're just doing it on the ground, not from a desk. Intel. Yes, it's not that you know that the United that we don't have people who you know go after enemies, uh, break down doors, and you know we have people like that, but they they're not they're they're military units. They're not the CIA. So we do have what's called targeted assassinations, right? Targeted killings. Um, Are you comfortable talking about that? Yeah, we have we have um, we have. Um, I mean. You know, we, we go after, uh, you know, terrorist leaders, uh, known terrorists, known enemies of the United States. Um, yeah, we do. Yes. Would that be primarily drone strikes or do you know, well, do they poison them? A lot, them? Do a lot they... of them are drone strikes and a lot of them are, you know, they're, they're you know, military, uh, you know, like. What, they send the seals in. the seals did in a bottom bot with Bin Laden. You know, they're military. Right, they kick the door in and kill them. That's right. And they try not to kill the uh, innocents. They try to take That's them, right. take them all down. High, you know, very targeted. Now, a lot of people in the CIA don't like drone strikes, and Doug is one of them. And because they're messy, their, their opposition to drone strikes. They would rather capture a, a, a known terrorist and interrogate the terrorist to get information out of him than to just, you know. Target him and 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 you know take him out with a drone strike. Now, do we still have what's called um, enhanced interrogation techniques? Do we still no, do we that? No, no. And also, enhanced interrogation techniques. A lot of them prove to be, you know, ineffective. Ineffective, yes. So we don't torture them. We don't. No, 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 no. I mean, the real, you know, we have we have uh, you know very highly trained interrogators in the FBI and the CIA, and when you talk to those people. You know, their techniques are sophisticated, and a lot of it has to do with, with sort of, you know, bonding, not bonding exactly, but creating a dialogue with the person that you're interrogating. And Sounds like most of these guys can be bought with money. They can bought, be bought with money, or you find out that they have a, a, a brother who is, you know, uh, got cancer, or a mother who is a family who is, uh, you know, uh, starving or you know there, there are there are deals that can be struck let's put it that way and the, the good and, and that's those are usually the best techniques for getting somebody to cooperate yeah because most people would say what you want them to say they start making up stuff that's if right. you torture them right and and if you look back at the history and you go through you know the, the whole in, enhanced interrogation uh period um which was you know in the 2003 through like 2006, 2007, um, a lot of people who were doing those in enhanced interrogation techniques were not the CIA or FBI. They were outside contractors that they hired because the, the guys, the experts wouldn't do it. They right. basically said, you know, that's just, the, you know, that's stupid. That's not going to work. It doesn't work because as you say, they just start spilling out of, you know, giving you names of people that don't exist and send you on a wild goose chase. So if you can, if you can form some kind of understanding with somebody, and as I said before, say, hey, look, I can help you if you help me. Like you, everybody's got a family. Everybody's got a mother or a father. A lot of these guys have children. I was going to ask about, I think I covered the questions I wanted to ask about. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to promote, a cause you wanted to talk about, a book coming up. Uh, I actually have a book coming out later this month. It's called uh, Hunt the Viper. I'm, I write a series of uh, seal thrillers, and each one of them is set in a separate uh, uh, country. Uh, and this one is set in Kurdistan and Syria. And it comes out, I think, the 22nd of May. And uh, it's the seventh book in the series. And uh, you know, I, I think it's, gonna, it's really good. So, and I, of course, and I used a lot of, uh, I have friends who were, uh, who, who have been doing the fighting, a lot of fighting in Syria and Kurdistan. And, uh, and I'm able to, you know, communicate with them via Skype and, you know, get lots of great information, which I incorporated into the book. Well, I'll look forward to reading it. Well, um, you. I've gotten a taste of your writing. I really like it. I'm going to oh, continue to read your work. Oh, thank you very much. And I really appreciate you coming on and, Spend a time with uh, me and the audience, and I'd like to have you back on later okay, when your other books come on. Yeah, I'd love to. This has been, I've enjoyed this very much. 
Well, I really appreciate it. And if the NSA is listening, I'd like to say hi. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much. I will talk to you later. Okay, thanks a lot, Luke. Thanks for listening to the Writing Monkey Podcast. Be sure to visit us online to access our comprehensive show notes and bonus content. Until next time, write, you monkey.